Um, Alana is a third year PhD student uh, at the University of Florida. Uh, I highlighted yesterday that we have been uh, grateful to have access to the CZI network of researchers and a connection with Alana was made through that network through her advisor, Eric Wang. Um, and um, I also highlighted yesterday that there's immense value in uh, putting your in depositing patient fibroblasts into Coreal. And Alana's talk here today is an example of um, of the exciting things we get to see when such resources are made available, when new researchers uh, are connected into our um, into our network. Um, so um, Alana's research actually focuses on RNA processing and protein expression. Um, today, she's going to be talking about um, specifically about the characterization of SLC6A8 misplicing and protein expression in a patient model of um, creatine transporter deficiency. Um, so Alana, with that, I'd uh, let you take it away. All right. Um, thank you very much for introducing me. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Alana, as you all know. And uh, yeah, I'll get into um, our uh, collaboration that I ha we had with the ACD. Um, I'm quite new to the creatine deficiency field, um, but it's been great to work with them. And I'll tell you all about what we've done. So the cerebral creatine deficiency syndrome, it's a group of disorders that affect some, uh, uh, some steps in the, the creatine synthesis pathway. So today I'm gonna be talking about a patient with creatine transporter deficiency where there is a deficiency with the creatine transporter. So creatine um, isn't transported into the vital organs that needs it, like the brain and the muscles, and there's a buildup of creatine in the blood. So the creatine transporter is the SLC6AA gene. Um, this gene, uh, there are many mutations in this gene that cause CTD. And um, uh, of all these mutations that cause CTD, it's unclear how these mutations mechanistically cause creatine transport deficiency in either the mRNA or at the protein level. So we worked with a patient that had a CTT, uh, uh, that had CTD and had a deletion in the SLC6A8 gene. Um, the deletion was 293 base pairs long. And this deletion encompasses part of exon 10, all of intron 10, all of exon 11 and a part of intron 11. So in a patient that is unaffected with CTD, the, the mRNA looks like this. There is exon 9 spliced to exon 10, spliced to 11, spliced to 12. Um, however, we wanted to investigate how does the mRNA of SLC6A8 with this specific deletion look like? So in order to investigate this, we first collected the patient fibroblasts from Coriel. Um, we use unaffected fibroblasts as control, so fibroblasts that did not have CTD. And then we isolated the RNA from these fibroblasts, and then we performed an RT-PCR. So we designed, uh, for the, the PCR, we designed a forward primer that starts at exon 9, and then a reverse primer that's at the end of exon 12 in order to capture this full region here. So we then uh, ran our PCR samples on a fragment analyzer. Uh, we ran the, the PCR fragments of the unaffected fibroblasts, and we see a band at around 514 base pairs. And this length is the length of exons 9, 10, 11, and 12. And we were able to extract this band and verify this through sequencing. So here is what a sequencing trace file looks like. We have exon 9 spliced to exon 10, 10 spliced to 11, and then 11 spliced to 12. Next, we ran the PCR fragments from the CTD fibroblasts, um, and we see that we get a, uh, a band at around 309 base pairs, and this is the length of exons 9 and 12. And so we excise this band and send it for sequencing to confirm, and in the trace file that we see, exon 9 is directly spliced to exon 12. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how this mechanistically works. Um, first, in an unaffected individual, we have, um, we have uh, the pre-mRNA of SLC6A8, and these introns are all spliced out, and we get the transcript that includes exons 9 through 12. In this patient, with, in the CTD patient with this specific deletion, we have this exon 10 that is skipped over 
during splicing, and then we get a product that has exon 9 spliced to exon 12. And we hypothesize that this uh, skipping event occurs because we are losing this 5' prime splice site uh, with the deletion, and the spliceosome isn't able to um, isn't able to detect the, the junction between the remaining exon 10 and this remaining intron 11. And so the skipping or, or the exclusion of exon 10 and 11 from this final uh, mRNA product actually doesn't cause a frame shift. So the transcript stays in frame and this has implications for a potential protein being produced. So in an unaffected individual, there, the mRNA of exons 9 through 12 will just be translated into the protein. Um, but in an individual with this specific deletion, exon 9 is spliced to exon 12, and a protein could theoretically be translated from this that doesn't include the amino acids from the sequences of exon 10 and exon 11. And we might even be able to detect some sort of altered protein through a Western blot. So I'll tell you a little bit about the SLC6A8 um, structure. These are some images from, uh, of the predicted structure um, and these were made um, using AlphaFold. And so this specific deletion encompasses amino acids 466 through 533. And in a typical SLC68 protein, there are 12 transmembrane domains. And this deletion um, affects transmembrane domains 10 and 11. So two transmembrane domains are deleted out of 12. And so this has potential implications for what happens if the protein is translated. So first, uh, a protein being translated could have this, um, that has this deletion, could insert itself into the membrane, but because it's missing those two transmembrane domains, it doesn't function properly as a creatine transporter, and then creatine is not, is not transported, causing CTD. Um, another kind of mechanism that could happen is the protein could be translated, but because it's, it's missing those two transmembrane domains, it might not insert itself properly into the membrane, then causing no creatine uptake. Um, there's another scenario where the protein is expressed, but because of its, the, the missing of those two transmembrane domains, it might not fold correctly, become misfolded, and the cell could degrade this protein. And these two scenarios, these, these first two scenarios, we might be able to detect this protein using a Western blot. Um, and in this final scenario, it's unlikely we would detect a protein through a Western blot because the, uh, depending on how fast the, the protein is degraded. So in order to investigate this, we again, collected those patient fire blasts. Um, this time we used HeLa cells as a control. Um, SLC68 is moderately expressed in HeLa cells. Um, unfortunately, those unaffected patient fire blasts that we had from earlier, we ended up losing them to some equipment malfunction recently. So um, in order to get some of these results out to everyone here um, quickly, we use HeLa as a control. Um, and we targeted the um, uh, SLC68 protein with an antibody that actually targets the N terminus of the protein. Since the deletion is closer to the C terminus, we wanted to uh, use an antibody targeting the N terminus in order to capture whatever protein that could be produced um, from this altered mRNA. So this is what the, the Western blot looked like. In the, in the first column, we have the HeLa cells. and the second column, we have the patient fire blasts. And what we see is that we do detect a protein that is the size of SLC68, around 70 kilodaltons. Um, and these bands uh, are uh, a little smeared, as you can see. Um, we think that this has to do with, uh, or this could have to do with the different glycosylation stages or states of SLC688. Um, in the HeLa, we're also seeing um, several other bands um, being, uh, being detected. And we hypothesize that this is uh, non specific binding of the antibody. Um, however, um, these results are, are very preliminary, and there's stuff that we do to, that we need to do in order to validate the results of this specific Western blot. Um, but we are seeing a protein being detected that is the size of SLC68. So, in order to validate the results of uh, this Western blot, we'll have to use positive and negative control fire blasts, fire blasts that express SLC68, and then fire blasts that do not. Um, this could be done using another uh, CTD patient fire blast um, that perhaps has a mutation closer to the N-terminus that might uh, make a frame shift and then potentially have nonsense media decay of that transcript and so we'd get no uh, protein. Um, and then also using another SLC68 antibody in order to validate the detection. So to conclude, in uh, 
we have a, a patient with a significant deletion in the SLC6A gene that encompasses part of exon 10, all of intron 10, all of exon 11, and a part of intron 11. And the pre mRNA includes this remnant of, of exon 10 and intron 11. And the, the, the splicing skips over this, this exon 10, and we get an mRNA product that has exon 9 spliced to exon 12. And then potentially we could get a protein that translates exon 9 spliced to exon 12, and we don't include the amino acid sequence that comes from exon 10 and exon 11. Uh, and this, uh, this presence of an alter protein has implications for therapeutics. So the expression of SLC688 protein with an altered function in patients with CDD could give rise to therapeutic approaches that utilize the presence of this protein, even if it's altered. So I'd like to acknowledge the Eric Wang Lab and my mentor, Eric Wang. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge um, some members of the lab that helped me specifically with this project. Um, I'd also like to thank Sankitha and Laura from the ACD um, for providing me the tools and the guidance in order to do this collaboration with them. Um, and then also acknowledge the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, the CZI, that connected us to the ACD. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Alana. Um, I should add for our audience members that um, Alana has been working on this only for a short time. Um, she put this together in, um, in a relatively short time, um, and we found out about it just last week, the results, and we thought um, it was a great way to spotlight um, a young researcher at, uh, um, at our conference and also use this as an opportunity to highlight the work that can be done on patient fibroblasts if such tools are made available. So once again, um, very obvious plug here, please go ahead and deposit your patient fibroblasts in Coriol. It's a great way to enable study on the disease, enable study on patient mutations. Um, thanks so much, Alana, for being here today. Um, uh, please stay with us. We're going to bring you back at the end of our speakers, uh, other speakers for a panel-based Q&A. Sure, I'll be here. Excellent. So um, at this time, I'd like to bring um, uh, Alois, um, Alois, if you're here and if you could confirm that your audio and video works, uh, we'd like to get ready for your talk. Okay, and thank you. While excellent. Okay, I would like to just to, to share my screen. While you bring that up, I'll just provide a brief background um, about you. Um, so, Alois is one of the co founders of Ceres Brain Therapeutics. Um, and he, uh, the company has been working on, under his direction, on working on providing CTD patients with a therapeutic solution. Um, Ceres's first medical candidate obtained um, the orphan drug designation by, from the EMA as well as the FDA. Today, Alois will be speaking to us about non-invasive nose-to-brain delivery of CVT-101. Um, I'll, I'll let Alois take it away from there. Thank you. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. I would like to, to, to thank the organizers for inviting me to this uh, very exciting day meeting. And uh, this is a, a great opportunity to let you know how our department, Frederick Julio Institute and the CRS Wealth Diabetics uh, Biotech Company, a spin off of CA are filling the gap between the experimental research and clinical therapy for creatine transporter deficiency. I would like just to remind you that the main research activities in my institute deal with integrative biology, um, brain imaging, diagnostic, and innovative therapeutics. I think that uh, Dr. Olivier Bresson and uh, the other colleagues yesterday give us a complete overview of creatine transporter deficiency. And we, we agree that the impairment of cellular creatine transporter is one of the main causes of clinical symptoms in CTD patients. So if we were able to reinstate creatine in CTD patients, we should achieve therapeutic efficacy.
Uh, as you well probably know, we have strong preclinical evidence of efficacy for CBT101 using uh, human uh, uh, cells for CTD patients and two knockout mouse model from Matthew Skelton and Laura Barocelli groups. Those two knockout mouse model recapitulate clinical feature of uh, human CTD. So we have demonstrated that CBT101, which is preferentially the cerebral neuron in all brain area. We also demonstrated that CBT101 deliver creatine in the brain and intracellularly. CBT101 restarts cerebral metabolism. We have demonstrated the high expression of pre and post-synaptic proteins, as well as the increase of cerebral intracellular glucose consumptions. We also demonstrated that CBT101 improves neurocognition. So we believe that nose to brain is the unique solution for CBT101 to reach the brain. And since the systemic administration leading to CBT101 hydrolysis without any path through the blood brain barrier. Next slide. Just to remind you, it's a non invasive pathway to transport drugs directly to the brain by passing the gatekeeper of the blood brain barrier. Two pathways are involved, the extracellular pathway and the intracellular pathway. Regarding the extracellular pathway, the drug is transported between the neighboring epithelial cells, and we say paracellular transport, or through the cells, and we say translitosis uh, transport. Regarding the intracellular pathway, drug is transported inside, inside the nerve axon. For translational perspective, to move from mouse to human patients, some things, things are to consider for non-clinical CNS administration studies. First of all, the relevance of animal CNS to human and the two species express similar target and receptor as human. As you well probably know, the nasal, the nasal cavity of the mouse is quite different to the nasal cavity of the human. The second thing is the pharmacokinetic drug exposure in plasma and the cerebrospinal fluid. And last but not least, the CNS drug distribution. As you will probably know, this slide shows you that the, in the, the, the mouse brain and the cerebrospinal fluid are 4,000 smaller than for human. And the cerebrospinal turnover in the mouse is two-fold higher than in the human. So it's very important for translational perspective to validate uh, findings uh, we have obtained in mouse in uh, non-human primate, which is very close to pediatric, uh, pediatric human. So in this view, we conducted a study in non-human primate. And the goal, the objective was to demonstrate that the non-invasive nose to brain delivery of CBT101 leads to the widespread CBT101 and brain creatine content and brain creatine content. So two experiments were performed. The first experiment was the repeated inhalation administration with the deuterium lablet CBT101, a dedicated formulation and specific device. The 
the non-human primate to receive free pay by an Australian, increasing doses for a total duration of 28 days. And on the day of necropsy, plasma and brain were isolated and kept for further analysis. The second objective was the effect of CBT101 and metabolite after single inhalation or single IV administration. As you can see on this slide, a non-intensive nose to brain delivery, delivery of CBT101 highlights the widespread CBT101 distribution in neuron and in different brain regions. As you can see in this slide, you see uh, the CBT101, uh, one microgram per gram of tissue in cortex here, in striatum, white matter, hippocampus, cerebellum and olfactory bulb. So the key message is that the nose to brain delivery of CTB101 increases significantly CBT101 distribution in different brain areas. And we also demonstrated that this increases of CBT101 in the different brain areas leads to the increase of some metabolites like creatine in the cortex and creatinine in the different brain areas. Regarding the glial cell, we also demonstrate, which is one of the component cells of brain parenchyma. So we also demonstrated that this nostrobrain delivery of CBT101 leads to a widespread CBT101 distribution also in cortex, striatum, white matter, hippocampus, and cerebellum. And in less extent, we have the metabolite like creatine and creatine. We also demonstrated a very limited CBT101 in brain endothelial cells of different brain, brain regions. We perform um, single administration, here nasal administration. And uh, as you can see at day three, day six, day nine, 16, and 28, the main metabolite in uh, plasma was creatinine instead of creatine. And we did not evidence this CBT101 in plasma after single nasal administration. And what about uh, single IV or nasal administration? Um, we show here that uh, uh, single IV administration on your left in plasma, the main metabolite we have identified is creatinine. So we have limited CBT101 in plasma. And in CSF, we have the same profile. CBT101 was not detected. However, we have the main metabolite in cerebrospinal fluid, which is creatinine. So the key message is that uh, CBT101 is uh, uh, distributed in the different brain areas and the main metabolite we identify in plasma and CSF was creatinine. Oh, sorry. So, the next slide. So, just to conclude. So, we, we bring a proof of concept 
we bring the strong evidence that nasal administration of CBT-141 leads to a widespread CBT-141 distribution into neurons and in the different brain areas. And in cerebrospinal fluid and in the blood, in the plasma, the main metabolite identified was creatinine. So I would like to thank the team, Sarah's team involved in, uh, in, um, in, in, this, uh, in this work, uh, Thomas Julino, CEO, and uh, uh, John Baptiste, uh, as well as uh, um, uh, Clemence Distier and my colleague, uh, uh, um, Henry. I would like to thank my lab, uh, involved in this uh, in this project, and I will have also to 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 thank especially extraordinary. Thank you for 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 your help and uh, Jerome Lejeune. I would like also to thank Matthew Skelter as well as Laura Barocelli for for the experiments we have conducted in the past and in the in the we will conduct it in the future. Thank you for your attention. Be sure that we are. We are, keep, we are filling the gap between experimental research and uh, clinical therapy for CT depression. We, uh, we are driven by ambitious clinical impact, decreasing symptom and improve, improving quality of life, restore, restoring social integration and ensuring a normal family life for siblings. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Alois. That's a good, that was a great talk. I'm sure uh, there will be a lot of questions in the Q and A session asking about the timeline for moving this to to human clinical trials. Um, I know we are finishing a couple minutes early, but uh, because we have five speakers in this session, I'd like to keep moving, and uh, we will perhaps gain a couple minutes. Um, in the Q&A session itself. So um, if that's okay with everyone, we'll move on to our next speaker. It's my pleasure to welcome Nicola Longo. Uh, uh, Nicola is a longstanding researcher in the field of CTD as well as GAMD. Um, he's from the University of Utah um, and his research concerns the molecular basis of metabolic disorders, um, their identification through newborn screening, natural history, and the development of novel therapies. Nicola, if you are here, uh, can you please confirm that your audio and video are functional and that you are able to bring up your slides at this time? Um, I also want to share that Nicola uh, is was the recipient of our Holiday Heroes Award, and um, the today he's going to be speaking about um, some of the work that was made possible uh, with that funding, as well as work that has been going on in his lab. Um, through the past uh, several, some years, I think. Um, so small molecules for the treatment of GAMT deficiency. Take it away. Okay. Thank you for having me here. Uh, uh, are you seeing full screen or partial screen? We can see full screen. Full screen, okay. Uh, thank you for having me here. So. Uh, Today, what I'm going to talk about is how we are trying to develop new molecules to treat patients with GAMP deficiency. And uh, we'll define in a second how guanidino acetate is synthesized, the current strategy to inhibit its synthesis, and then how we are going to identify inhibitors of uh, arginine glycine amidinotransferase. So what is GAMP deficiency? I don't need to explain it to you, but it is a condition that uh, affects the brain. It's one of the brain creatine deficiency syndrome. And different from all others, restoring creatine alone in the brain is not sufficient for therapy. We have also to inhibit the synthesis of guanidino acetate. And uh, the therapy that we currently have is the administration of creatine 
and then the administration of other chemicals in addition to restriction of arginine supply to limit the synthesis of guanidinoacetate. We know that the therapy is effective if started early in life because some people have been treated uh, at birth and they have done, uh, I would say, remarkably well. Let's review a second what is the reaction. The reaction converts glycine and arginine into ornithine and guanidino acetate. And obviously, by restricting protein in the diet, we restrict the amount of arginine. By giving sodium benzoate, we combine the glycine and reduce its concentration. At the same time, by giving ornithine, we tend to push the reaction back. We also give creatine, which is the final product of the reaction. And creatine, as we have seen from the work of Dr. Schulze, inhibits expression of the agat gene or uh, uh, decrease the production of this enzyme. At the same time, what we have seen, we have seen that uh, after a certain concentration, at least in humans, there is no further reduction in the expression of this gene. In other words, uh, at the beginning, there is some inhibition. Now, the question is, how do we go above and beyond what we can? I have to say that even with the best therapy, guanidino acetate is reduced in patients with GAMP deficiency, but not normalized. It still remains uh, sometimes three, four, five times above normal. So how do we get to reduce the guanidino acetate that is uh, toxic for the brain? So there are other therapies in development here, such as gene therapy and gene editing, but these are experimental. We still do not know how to get exactly to the cell that, gene, that need the, the genetic correction. And uh, I would say that we still don't know exactly which one they are. So obviously we can correct all of them, but at the same time, we are still not quite there. So the idea is to inhibit directly the enzyme uh, uh, agar, so arginine glycine amidinotransferase by specific inhibitor. So if we can design this inhibitor, obviously the enzyme will be uh, uh, not functional. As a result, we, we will have to continue to give creatine to patients with GAN in addition to the new inhibitor. Now, agat is expressed uh, for, in many cell types, but the one that from a quantitative standpoint is the most important for the production of uh, guanidino acetate is the kidney. And it is located inside mitochondria in the, in the kidney. At this point, guanidino acetate produced by the kidney is transported to the liver, where the GAMT enzyme converts guanidino acetate into uh, uh, creatine. So if we look at the uh, structure of the kidney, the uh, agat enzyme is expressed within uh, 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 mitochondria. And obviously that can be uh, a problem because the way that we do with mitochondrial protein, we need to put a, 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 a leading peptide to lead the protein once they're synthesizing the cytoplasm inside mitochondria. And in fact, when we started trying to uh, purify the agar enzyme from cell, we noticed that it was very difficult to purify. Again, we thought that it was due to the presence of the leader peptide. So what we did, we removed the leader peptide from the uh, agar uh, cDNA and substituted that with a, a histidine tag that would allow easier purification of the enzyme once produced. This was effective and improved quite a bit the recovery of the enzyme, as you can see in this band. Now, once we start the test in the initial production, we had some initial uh, good results. So the way that we do, obviously the reaction produced, sorry, the reaction of the agate enzyme produced both ornithine and guanidino acetate. But at the beginning, we didn't have an assay to measure the guanidino acetate. 
So we measure the ornithinolone, and the assay indicated that there was a, a linear production of ornithin as we increased the amount of enzyme. However, when we started uh, to develop a more quantitative assay able to detect simultaneously both guanidino acetate and ornithin, uh, this assay did not uh, pay out. So in other words, some of the data were not easy to reproduce until what we realized is that we needed to uh, change the, the reaction uh, to, uh, uh, to do a couple of things. Number one, we had to increase the concentration of substrate. Number two, we had to increase the concentration of enzyme. So we need to have much more enzyme than originally anticipated. At the same time, we were able to measure the equimolar production of ornithine and guanidino acetate, confirming that the uh, agate enzyme really produced an equal amount of both compounds once it is fully effective. This also created a, a little bit of a problem. Why? Because to create a high throughput uh, system, we need to produce a lot of agate enzyme to place in our 96 well plate. How did we solve it? So a new system was developed to further purify the enzyme in which we were able to homogenize the uh, uh, cell a little bit better and we added a couple of purification steps that allow us to obtain a pretty pure protein in quite a large amount. What are we doing with this protein? So we are collaborating with uh, uh, Dr. Neil Erickson at Atomwise that has identified 100 putative inhibitors of the active site of the agate enzyme, which is shown here with arginine, which is the natural, one of the natural substrate in the active site. And they have designed uh, synthetic inhibitors, synthetic compound that combine to this uh, site and inhibit the reaction. Uh, now that we have a system that it is finally working and am amenable to high throughput assay, we are going to move on. So uh, I have to say that you know, this past year has been very hard for us to find personnel to work. And that has slowed down a little bit the progress of this project, but at the same time, finally, we have been able to improve the assay and to uh, uh, make it amenable to high throughput uh, screening. So in summary, GAM deficiency in peer screening synthesis and a result in the accumulation of guanidino acetate Therapy with creatine is very effective in agate deficiency, but instead in gum deficiency, we also need to suppress the formation of GAA. Inhibition of agate could decrease the, the synthesis of guanidino acetate, restoring normal level of this compound in the brain, and an inhibitor of agate together with creatine supplement could greatly improve the outcome of patients with gum deficiency not just the ones that are identified at birth, but we hope to further improve even the outcome of patients who are symptomatically diagnosed by removing the toxic effect of guanidino acetate in the brain. The big advantage of this therapy is that being a small molecule should be able to enter the brain and being able to, to reduce the synthesis in the cell that produce that inside the brain, irrespectively of the type of cell that they are. I want to thank all of the people that have contributed to this project. Uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Bijina Balakrishnas, uh, Dr. Kent Lai, who have worked on the synthesis and assay of the enzyme, uh, Dr. Marcia Pasquale and Dr. Ingolia, who have uh, performed the assay with tandem mass spectrometry, Dr. Neil Henriksen at Atomwise, all patients and their family, and I want to thank the Association for Creatine Deficiency for their general support. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicola. That was a wonderful talk. Um, we'll keep moving ahead. Um, our next speaker um, for the session is Alex Lee. 
Um, Alex is a graduate student at the University of Toronto. Uh, Alex, uh, while I uh, move ahead with your bio, could you please bring on your audio and video and your slides? Um, so to continue, um, Alex um, is a master's candidate at the Department of Biochemistry at the University of Toronto. He works with Dr. Andreas Schulze um, at the Hospital of Sick Children. Uh, his research involves determining the mechanism by which creatine regulates the expression of AGAT. Um, his talk is titled Identifying the Mechanism by which Creatine Represses Expression of AGAT. Um, I also want to highlight um, for our community here that Alex um, is one of the recipients of the ACD Fellowship uh, starting last year. Uh, so we're really excited to hear from him this year. Um, it's been about six months of work, uh, um, I think, um, on this particular project leading up to the findings over here. Um, so really excited to have Alex present here. You'll be hearing from our ACD fellows, uh, two of our other ACD fellows later today as well. Um, and with that, um, Alex, please um, go ahead. Um, can I just make sure that you can hear me and see my screen? Yes. All right. So thank you for the introduction. My name is Alex from the Schultz Lab, and today I'll be presenting my research on identifying the mechanism by which creatine represses the expression of arginine glycine immunotransferase, or AGOT. Um, so creatine is a molecule that facilitates the recycling of ATP, the primary source of energy in the cell. When creatine is taken up by the cell via the creatine transporter, it can be converted into phosphocreatine via the activity of creatine kinase. In this way, phosphocreatine acts as a shunt for hydrogen phosphor groups and facilitates the transport around the cell. Phosphocreatine can then in turn be hydrolyzed in order to regenerate ATP from ADP. The combination of creatine, phosphocreatine, and creatine kinase act in conjunction to buffer imbalances in ATP levels within the cell and maintain its homeostasis. Initially being taken up by cells via the creatine transporter, creatine can also be synthesized within the cell via the activity of two enzymes. The first is arginine glycine aminotransferase, or AGAT, and this uses glycine and arginine to synthesize guanine acetate, as well as ornithine as a byproduct. GAA can then be converted into creatine through the activity of guanine acetate methyltransferase, or GANS, and this is done using acetylmethionine as a methadone to facilitate this reaction. With regards to how creatine synthesis is regulated, this can occur in two ways. The first is through enzymatic inhibition, in which ornithine acts to inhibit the activity of AGAT, and the second being in which creatine can act on agat to repress the expression, thereby resulting in a negative feedback loop to reduce creatine synthesis. While it's well known that creatine can inhibit the activity of agat, the mechanism by which this occurs, as well as how this process is regulated, is not well understood. Studies in the past have shown that increasing serum creatine levels, whether it be due to increased synthesis or through creatine supplementation, have resulted in reduced agat mRNA levels, protein levels, as well as enzymatic activity. Based upon the observation that changes in agat mRNA levels, quite with changes in agat protein levels, this therefore suggests that the regulation of agat occurs at a pre-translational level. So with all of this, the, main, the aim of my project is twofold. The first is to determine if creatine regulates agat in a transcriptional and or post-transcriptional manner, and the second being to identify the mechanism by which creatine represses the expression of agat. In today's presentation, I'll be focusing primarily on this first aim. So the first thing I want to do is determine if agat regulates or sorry, if creatine relates agat in a transcriptional manner. To do this, we created a construct containing the, proponent, the promoted region of agat, part of its non-coding and coding region, which is then linked to the expression of a luciferase reporter. We're going to transcribe this construct into cells and measure luciferase luminescence. So in the wild type or control construct, in the presence of creatine, we observe a five-fold reduction in luciferase luminescence levels relative to an untreated condition. This makes sense because in the presence of creatine, we have reduced levels of agat and therefore reduced luciferous luminescence. As we delete regions of the agat from motors in the front, from the five-prime end, we observe that we still maintain relatively high levels of luciferous luminescence. However, when we delete this specific region of the agat from motor, we observe that we go from having an eight-fold reduction in luciferous luminescence to only a two-fold reduction in luciferous luminescence. And so therefore, this suggests then that this specific region of the agat from motor is important for facilitating creatine rate depression. However, as you can see, even with this region of promoted deleted, we still have some degree of luciferous luminescence being repressed. And so therefore, this then indicates that part of the non-coding or coding region of agat may also play a role in facilitating creatine depression. To investigate this question, we then have this construct here containing the promoted region of agat, 
part of its non-coding and coding region as indicated in black and red respectively. And these are both part of exon one of Algods, which is then linked to a Lucifer's reporter. Using this construct, we, we then transpose into cells and observe how creation response to measure creative response. And so in the wall type for control, as we expect, this construct responds to creatine. Mm -hmm. However, in the absence of this Agat coding region, we observe that we suddenly lose the ability of Agat to respond to creatine, whereas the coding region by itself with a CMV promoter is able to respond to creatine. Based upon this observation, this therefore suggests that the Agat coding region may contain a motif that is important for facilitating the repression via creatine. Finally, we want to use the same construct to determine if Agat could be regulated in a closed transcriptional manner. So we have the same construct, transpect them into cells, and we treat with either creatine, as well as actinomycin D, which is a transcriptional inhibitor, or cyclohexamide, which is a translational inhibitor. And so on the figure on the left, we're looking at actinomycin D treatment. So here we have actinomycin with, um, we have the control, creatine treatment, actinomycin D, and then creatine with actinomycin D. And we can observe that in the presence of both creatine and actinomycin D, we have reduced luciferous luminescence relative to either actinomycin D or creatine by itself. Based upon this observation, this therefore suggests that creatine actinomycin D act on agot in two different manners and therefore results, and therefore um, creatine can act on agot in a post transcriptional manner. When we look at cyclohexamide treatment on the hand, so here we have control, creatine treatment, cyclohexamide, and creatine with cyclohexamide, we can observe that treating the cells with creatine and cyclohexamide together versus cyclohexamide by itself yields the same effect. And so therefore, this suggests that creatine does not have a post-translational effect on Agat. So up until this point, all that I presented to you so far has been done using constructs that we transpect into cells, and then we use luciferase luminescence to determine how um, Agat expression is affected in the presence of creatine. So moving forward, what we want to do is we want to look at endogenous levels of Agat mRNA and observe to see how creatine affects those mRNA transcripts directly, rather than using luciferase luminescence as a readout instead. To do this, we use a technique known as nascent RNA labeling, which allows us to track the rate of transcription and degradation of nascent RNA. In order to do this, we first pulse our cells with a compound known as ethanol uridine or EU. And this is a uridine molecule that contains the ethanol group as indicated here. And this EU becomes incorporated into RNA as transcription of RNA occurs. After doing so, we can then extract the RNA and perform a biotinization reaction in which the ethanol group on the EU reacts specifically with the biotin azide and result in addition of a biotin handle on specific RNA molecules. We can then, we can then selectively pull down biotin-related transcripts using stripavidin beads and then perform reverse transcription and qPCR to quantify the results. The importance of this technique is that it allows us to perform two types of experiments. We perform both pulse and a pulse trace experiment. In the pulse experiment, our main goal here is to determine the rate of mRNA synthesis, whereas in the pulse trace, we're looking at the rate of mRNA degradation. So in the context of my project, in the pulse experiment, we have two conditions. So we have a control condition without creatine and a condition with creatine. And we want to determine to see if creatine affects the rate of agot mRNA synthesis. Whereas in the pulse chase, what we're looking at here is we're looking to see how the presence of creatine affects the rate of agot mRNA degradation over time. That's so the first one to do is determine to see if creatine has a transcriptional effect on agot. To do this, we first pulse ourselves with, sorry, we treat ourselves with creatine for 15 hours, and we pulse ourselves with EU for either 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes, pulse ourselves, extract RNA, perform all the downstream steps I mentioned previously. And so here's the data for that. So we're looking at the 30 minute, 60 minute, 90 minute pulse. And what we're looking at here is looking at all that mRNA full change relative to the control group. And so what this means is that a value of more than one would indicate we have more all that mRNA in the creatine treatment group relative to the control, whereas a full change of less than one indicates we have less Agat mRNA in the creatine treatment group relative to control. Now, as you can see here, regardless of which pulse duration we have, we can see that in the presence of creatine, we have reduced levels of Agat mRNA relative to control. And so therefore, this suggests that creatine can regulate Agat in a transcriptional manner by reducing the amount of mRNA being synthesized. While this data does suggest that creatine can regulate Agat in a transcriptional manner, it does not rule out the possibility of a post transcriptional manner of regulation. And so that's what we'll be investigating next. To do that, we pulse our cells with EU for 21 hours, wash the cells and change media. So we'll either, we'll either give it normal media or creative clean media, and then let the cells sit in that creative media for specific time points. At each time point, we we'll then collect the cells, extract RNA, and do all the downstream steps. And so here's the data for that. And so what we're looking at here is we're looking at the levels of agot mRNA over time relative to time zero. So on the graph on the left, we have agot expression normalized to gap pH. 
Now on the right, we have auto expression normalized to HPRT1, which is, a, which is an additional housekeeping gene. And so we can see, because of which graph we look at, we can see the amount of agot mRNA declines over time as expected. We can also see that in the presence of creatine, we see that agot mRNA declines at a faster rate relative to the control. Based upon this observation, this suggests that creatine can have a post transmittal effect on agot by re increasing the rate of its degradation and possibly via reducing its stability. So in conclusion, the data I've shown today suggests that both the promoter and coding region of agot are important for regular expression. In addition, we can see that creatine can regulate agot in both a transcriptional and post-transcriptional manner. We can see that in presence of creatine, we have reduced levels of agot mRNA being transcribed. And we can also observe that presence of creatine results in an increased rate of agot mRNA degradation by reducing its stability. Moving forward, what we're going to do is perform RNA sequencing in order to further validate the results of both the pulse and pulse experiments. In addition, we also want to determine which nucleotides within the coding region of agot are vital for facilitating creatine depression. To do this, we'll be using both site-directed and immunogenesis and basically mutate nucleotides to change amino acids and observing to see how this affects the ability of agot to respond to creatine. So I'd like, I'd like to thank the members of my lab for their support and assistance. And as a recipient of a fellowship in the ACD, I'd like to thank them for funding this project. Thank you for listening. Alex, thank you so much for that talk. That was, uh, that was really great. Uh, please stay on with us for our Q&A session where uh, I'm hoping we will have a deeper discussion on the implications of your findings and your work. Said Jonathan Schlebach and Sean Sumner will be moderating this session. We have a ton of questions to get through and the next session to get started with. Thankfully, we are well in time. Uh, I'll request the moderators to round robin uh, direct questions to the speakers. And I also request the speakers to please keep your answers succinct so that we may get to everyone. Uh, John and Sean, <laughs> take it away. Great, thank, thank you. Um, so yeah, we'll start out with a question for Alana. Um, so yeah, please, and also please forgive Sean and I that there's a lot of questions we're trying to keep up with. Uh, we'll try to get to yours. Um, so uh, someone, so one, one question I have just based on what you have and haven't answered is, is how, you know, there are predictions for splicing. Um, how did the splicing predictors compare to what you see? And does that have any bearing on whether the splicing predictors are more or less likely to be correct or incorrect in other places in the transcript? I'm um, sure. Well, like in terms of splice predictor, as in like programs that can predict splicing out. Yeah, yeah. Or... Like if you go into these databases, right, you'll see predicted splice, you know, uh, disruption or not, right? Are they are they accurate for for SLC six A eight? So I'm not sure. We didn't actually look at um, splicing predictors. That we just went right into doing the RT PCR to see what would happen, um, and we kind of predicted that something like this would happen. That we'd have a skipping event just based on losing that five prime splice site. Um, yeah, that's what we predicted, um, but we haven't looked at um, splicing predictors yet. Um, some of them can be accurate in terms of um, if there are splice site mutations that they can predict the um, the like a splice site score and how much that could be reduced. So there, the some of the models are good for predicting um, splice site uh, strength and how that strength decreases if there's a mutation. Great, thank you, uh, Sean. You want to do the next one? Yeah, uh, Doctor Mabanzo. It looked like you had post uh, marked this one as one you wanted to address live. Um, how do you explain that the creatinine and not the CBT 101 is the major metabolite found in the plasma? Um, is it getting is the CBT 101 getting trapped in the brain and not transported? Or yes, uh, yes, uh, I, I, I think that CBT 101 is uh, trapped into the brain. And in the plasma, there is some uh, uh, intra, uh, um, intramolecular attack of CBT101, and which is convert into creatinine. OK. All right. Um, all right, thank you. So next up, a question for Dr. Longo. Um, Someone asked about, you mentioned 100, 100 putative lead compounds. Someone asked about, you know, those compounds, and I'm sure, you know, it's still really early in the game, but, but one question related to that that might be worth asking is whether those, you know, 100 lead compounds came out of a random chemical library or if those are 
potentially, you know, any of them are might be related to existing therapeutics. Do we know anything about toxicity, for instance? So those compounds were generated on their ability to be water soluble. And also with uh, obviously in theory with limited toxicity now, uh, we do not know exactly what, uh, you know, what they do because uh, many of them are totally novel. But uh, and they were designed based on the uh, on the uh, on the structure of the enzyme. So uh, that it is what we know. Now we need to go further. To but the idea is really to have something which is very little toxic, very well water soluble, capable of getting everywhere, and very effective. That it is how they were generated by a company that usually does this compound for uh, pharmaceutical use. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, Alex, are the regulatory mechanisms cell type specific, or do you think they're the same across all cells and organs? Um, in my case, I have only tested the regulatory mechanisms on one type of cell, but we predict it should be conserved among other cell types as well, seeing as we're looking at the effect of creatine on agon mRNA specifically, which I suppose it wouldn't be restricted to only one cell type. Great. Um, okay. Uh, next up, uh, question for Dr. Stepan. Um, someone in the audience asked a good question about um, how and slash whether academics can engage with Resolute in terms of collaborating uh, and making use of these resources. So Absolutely. Yeah. So um, yep. So I would encourage you to our website. So as part of the consortium. We do um, public releases on data and reagents, um, but I would encourage you to reach out. Um, as, and as a matter of fact, one of the things we're doing, um, we are making high affinity binders. So we've contacted a lot of the big sort of structural biology labs in the world. So if someone gives us a protein, we put it through our pipeline. So um, yeah, definitely reach out. Great. Um, I guess we'll cycle back to the beginning then. Um, another question for Elena that, that I had. Um, someone asked in the prompt um, about this specific mutation. I think um, Laura asked, answered some questions about it and, and why it's of interest. But someone did ask that question of penetrance in, in terms of whether there are multiple patients. I mean, is this a common one? And, and generally speaking, are these types of splice variants more common than, for instance, missense, nonsense variants? Um, if you could speak to that, that'd be good. So I'm not sure about the, the frequency of each of these mutations. Um, this is the, uh, as I think as Laura said, the largest one that's been detected. Um, and so most mutations will likely not be this large, they'll usually be smaller. Um, and then there's many, I'm, I've seen that there are many different other mutations that, that cause CTD. And even point mutations seem to drastically reduce the function of the, of the protein or completely make it non-functional. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure exactly about the frequency, um, but a large lesion like this would likely have a, a very large effect on the function of this protein. Sure, great, thank you. Um, Claire, Laura had a question. Um, what are the what are other alternatives for SLC six A eight? And there are other SLC genes that are expressed in the brain similarly, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, it'd be great. I'm not sure what you mean by alternative. So other, other transporters that could compensate? Yes, I think I see where you're going yeah. with this, Sean. So, you know, a lot of us have, have asked this question about whether there's functional redundancy with some of these transporters. Yeah. And some of your inter interactome data, for instance, suggested that might be the case. But, and, you know, to that point, I really like that you said, well, you can generate hypotheses with this. But one, you know, A, you know, you, you mentioned maybe a few transporters that lit up that might be similar to SLC6 to 8. Um, and B, you know, if that's the case, is there any way in your data of seeing which transporters have known inhibitors that we could maybe test some of those hypotheses with? Um, yeah, I mean, again, it's just it's just an observation, right? So, but I would say it's a possible hypothesis. So, yeah. So, one of the things I guess we think about, I mean, I guess you're thinking about gain of function, which is is very hard, right? All the drugs to date inhibit the transporters, 
Um, but I think between, so one is if you know another transporter that transports creatine, you could think about a functional compensation. I guess the other that we're trying to do is, like I said, with the interactome proteomics, sometimes the deficiency is really, you know, I guess analogous to CFTR is that the transporter doesn't get to the plasma membrane. So you could think about molecular chaperone. So I think we have a lot of data to mine. Um, I guess, you know, it would be great maybe to sit down. We're happy to sit down and, and go into detail to see about testing some of these hypotheses. Again, as we all know, I think omics data sets are, but what we're trying to do, I guess our approach, like I said, is really systematically look across the family and look for themes. So I guess the other is, you know, the more you understand maybe related transporters, will that help you on the function of SLC6A8? So, um, that, that's what we're trying to do. Um, so hopefully that answers your question a little bit. Thank you. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll ask a question for Alex. Um, I'm interested in this post-transcriptional regulation of the transcript stability. Um, I'm curious if the, the transcript itself has any abnormal codon usage or things that might suggest a, a role for translation kinetics any thoughts about sort of what what might be the the pathways for degrading this transcript? Um, so in regards to clones, we haven't really looked at the sequence of the algorithm directly, but we do have a hypothesis regarding how the post transcriptional mechanism of degradation could occur. We hypothesize it may have to do with how creatine may interact with the mRNA in conjunction with the ribosome, resulting in possible stalling and possible degradation downstream of that. But we haven't move forward with that, yes, and that's more of a long-term goal of the project. And so that's just a possible hypothesis that we have. Sure. Sean, do you have one, Sean, or? I'm sorry, I'm searching through our our list here. Um, I don't have one ready right now. If you okay. have one, go ahead. Yeah, I'll ask a question for Dr. Longo. Um, uh, the the enzyme assay data is interesting. I was curious if uh, you had um, you measured KM and whether that gives us any clues about sort of the the substrate concentration levels that might be relevant for for this enzyme and and whether that might be make it more or less druggable. Uh, so, sorry, can you repeat the question? I didn't hear it well. So my so, hearing yes. is not, not you. Okay. Sorry. So the, the main question I had was, you know, with your enzyme data, did you figure, were you able to figure out what KM would be for, for this enzyme? And does that relate to substrate concentrations in cells? Yeah. So uh, the, the KM is very high for both, uh, or, uh, for both uh, glycine and arginine. It is about uh, two to three millimolar. So very high level. And uh, what I'm trying to do now is try to determine what concentration of ornithine are sufficient to block the reaction. So uh, the reason is that, you know, we use ornithine as a therapy in patients with GAMP deficiency, but we do not know what our target would be. So I'm trying to do the same experiment, trying putting increasing concentration of ornithine to decrease the concentration of guanidino acetate. Mm -hmm. so, and and one more... Another yeah, question that was asked, I believe, was about the, the pH. We explored different ranges of pH, but didn't see much of an effect. So, and one related question, um, from the kinetics, do you see any evidence that this might be allosterically regulated, or do you think it's, no? no. Okay. I, I'm not seeing that, so. Okay. It seems I was just that, curious uh, if there, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and the problem is that when you test in vitro, you just put salt, uh, and uh, pH and uh, not much more. So uh, I would have to do the reaction in vivo to see if there is anything else that it is not part of my reaction. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Mabonzo, um, are you guys uh, nearing clinical trials or do you guys have an ETA for that kind of thing on your CBT 101? Yes, we, we, we expect to, 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 to move into clinical trial. So, but uh, we need some uh, additional uh, uh, experiments before clinical trials. Yes, of course, this is our goal. This is our target. Move uh, as soon as possible into the clinical trial. 
Uh, I have a, another question for Dr. Stefan. Um, someone asked a question about um, the 69 assays that you cited for these solute carriers. Um, someone asked basically what, what the you know, criteria is for this and how specific they might be. Um, do you guys have a way of sort of figuring out which assays might be better than others or more or less useful? Or is it basically just this uh, uh, aggregating what, what people do? So we have actually, uh, so within our, our research plan, so we have two, two um, efforts that are focused on this. So one is just focused on um, proof of concept. So basically generate demonstration that the transporter is functional in, in the substrate you're testing. So, you know, again, it's saturable, sort of the KM. The other work package we have is actually uh, focused on uh, delivering a medium to high throughput assay that would be validated to run a screen. So with that, we have criteria like you do. So we have Z primes. Um, so depending on the technology we're using, it's anywhere from three to four to 1536 well format. And, and basically the assay, we bring it to validation. And then the idea is that like any of the farmer partners can internalize it and screen their proprietary file. So we do have criteria by which we when we say an assay is validated so that it, you know, the signal to noise, the HP, ZP, um, the heuristics that we define the, the assay as being valid. Great, thank you. I don't know if you saw anything else, Sean, that, that needs to be. Um, I think we've hit most of them. Do you have anything uh, in your list? Um, I think we're doing pretty good. You guys did a great job of answering as we went along. Um, yeah. We're this was a great conversation too. We have so many questions. I think we're gonna keep the speakers in the <laughs> the on the on the panelists so that we can continue answering them. Um, and thanks so much, Jonathan and Sean, for moderating this. And uh, a big thank you to all of the speakers here. I think this was a great start to the day with a lot of talks and a lot of information. So we really appreciate all the work here.